In our modern, interconnected world, no country can thrive without efficient trade routes, not even superpowers. China, one of the most populous countries, faces a unique challenge. Its land lacks essential resources and minerals like fossil fuels and alternative energy sources. This scarcity limits China's industrial potential and global economic influence. To overcome this, China relies heavily on importing natural gas and oil. About 80% of these imports pass through the Malacca Strait, a crucial maritime choke point. These sea lines of communication, or SLOCs, are vital for trade and house many of the world's seabed internet cables, possibly even streaming this very video to you. While China can control its internet with the Great Firewall, a censorship system blocking undesirable content, controlling ships in the Malacca Strait is another matter. This narrow passage is a geopolitical hotspot, where ships from Europe, the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, and the Americas must navigate to reach China's waters. The nations bordering this strait wield significant power over global trade. India in particular holds a strategic advantage. Though the strait isn't within its territorial waters, India controls the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, an archipelago of 836 islands spanning 490 miles, with 31 inhabited. These islands serve as a critical choke point for maritime traffic. But how do these islands impact international trade? As it turns out, in a big way. While the islands themselves are small and not particularly economically significant, their location shuts off many international trading routes that would be able to pass through the Indian Ocean. Together with the neighboring countries of Myanmar, Indonesia, and Thailand, the archipelagos create an enclosed sea that most ocean-faring trade has to pass through to get to the other side of the Malacca Strait. The coastlines of the three countries create clear divides, but the islands are much more spread out. Effectively, they separate the eastern side of the Malaccan Strait into three smaller passageways. The first is the six-degree channel on the southern end of the archipelago, bordering the Indonesian island of Sumatra. This 100-mile-wide channel is one of the few ways ships can bypass going around the Indian mainland, instead of going through the open waters of the Indian Ocean. It's a shorter and more profitable sea route for trade incoming from Africa, and even some Middle Eastern routes use the channel to avoid the other bottlenecks. On the northern end of the archipelago are the two remaining passageways, collectively called the Pripatis Channel after the namesake island that belongs to Myanmar. The southern passageway goes between the Preparis and the Coco Island, which itself is just north off the Andaman Islands. The northern passageway passes between Preparis and mainland Myanmar. The combined width of these two passageways is around 110 miles. After that, most trade routes pass through the Indian Ocean, mainly going alongside the Indian coast and then onward to the Suez or Hormuz Straits, both significant trading bottlenecks for Europe and the Middle East and vital in distributing oil and natural gas. This means that India would realistically need to only exert pressure onto about 200 miles of open sea. And if that happens and India decides to cut off China from accessing the routes around the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, China would need to send ships via a much longer route through Indonesia or use a Trans-Pacific route, which only realistically connects China to the Americas, where none of the countries have significant resources that China needs, apart from the US. Additionally, China's main economic and geopolitical rival is indeed the US, so trade between the two would likely be broken off if India and China were to get into a conflict. This is also due to India and the US being part of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or the Quad, alongside Japan and Australia. But how much would China be affected if the Malaccan Strait were to become inaccessible? According to the World Bank, roughly 37% of China's GDP stems from trade. Of that, the Center for Strategic and International Studies estimated that 60% of China's trade passes through the strait. While this includes the vital oil and natural gas that the country is importing from the Middle East, it also accounts for other valuables. However, since China is in a desperate need of more oil and gas to prop up its industry, these resources have the most profound effect on its economy. Therefore, removing the Strait of Malacca as a potential trade route for China would likely heavily increase the price of resources it imports via the Europe, Middle East, or African sea routes. It would spike the energy price in the country and likely cause significant societal and economic changes. China's dependence on the Malaccan Strait has been brought up infrequently over the past two decades. However, in 2015, China's military strategy acknowledged that the security of overseas interests concerning energy and resources, strategic SLOCs, as well as institutions, personnel, and assets abroad has become an imminent issue. As such, it's no surprise that China has been very vocal in trying to exert control and pressure over the entire Indo-Pacific in an attempt to retain a grip on the Malaccan Strait. 
To that end, it's also implemented a few safety nets to reduce its reliance on trade passing through the Malaccan Strait. One of these is the proposed Thai or Kra Canal, which would cut through Thailand's mainland and provide another way for connecting the Andaman Sea in the west to the Gulf of Thailand in the east. While the project has been proposed multiple times since the 1930s and proposals existed far earlier than that, even in the 17th century, the canal was never considered a feasible project. Coincidentally, one of the most recent proposals for building the canal came from the Thai Chinese Culture and Economic Association of Thailand TCCEAT. Proposals suggested that it would allow Thailand to tap into the trade tariffs that are currently imposed by Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. On the Chinese side, it would allow the country's trade vessels to go into the Andaman Sea more directly, bypassing one of the biggest trade bottlenecks in the world. However, the Kra Canal isn't a complete solution. Even if it were to be built, and some estimates suggest it would be a decade-long $28 billion undertaking, there's still the issue of India having near-immediate control of the shipping route that comes out of the canal. While the canal bypasses the strait, shipping routes would still have to travel around the Indian archipelagos, therefore giving India the final say, so to speak, into how trade to and from the canal would be conducted. Furthermore, routes that use the canal would no longer feasibly be able to take a circuitous route around Indonesia. That's one reason China has been aggressive with the US and its allies for exerting a military presence in the area around the strait. Since China's navy only operates in the South China Sea, the US and its ally Singapore can more readily close China off from accessing the Malaccan Strait, even preventing Chinese naval forces from ever reaching the Indian Ocean. The closest port to the Malaccan Strait that the Chinese could use is the Reem Naval Base in Cambodia, some 620 miles from the strait itself. This would make China woefully unprepared for any conflict surrounding the strait if Singapore called upon its US ally to close it off. From Washington's standpoint, being able to control the Malaccan Strait is one of the few measures the US Army has in limiting China's presence and geopolitical influence not only in the Indo-Pacific but worldwide. If a conflict over Taiwan were to start in the next couple of years, and some strategies suggest that that may very well happen, the US could potentially shut off 60% of China's trade-based income and a bulk of its energy imports. This would cripple China's economy and war readiness, making it unable to sustain a prolonged conflict against the US and its allies. Furthermore, the US Marines are currently undergoing a decade-long conversion process into littoral or coastal combat units meant to exert significant military and strategic presence while scattered around the islands in the South China Sea and East China Sea. The project, known as Force Design 2030, aims to reduce the US Marine Corps' reliance on tanks and other land-based combat units, as well as minimize the need for ships and planes within this branch of the US Army. Instead, the US Marines would be redesigned to be more self-sufficient while away from friendly bases, relying on dispersal tactics and existing systems present in the US Navy and Air Force to support their operations. As such, the Marines are currently being equipped with long-range artillery capabilities with a number of the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket Systems or HIMARS doubling in 2018. With the US holding several vital alliances in the area, such as India, Japan, Singapore, and Australia, the US Marines would likely serve as the first response before the bulk of the US and Allied navies could actually exert pressure in the Chinese seas. What all this means is that China is hopelessly behind in terms of military presence to control the trade going through the Strait of Malacca, and India maintaining a stranglehold on the Strait's western end is only complicating matters. To compensate for its reliance on trade over Malacca, China has already tried to diversify its import portfolio, particularly for energy and fossil fuels. One of the biggest breaks the country enjoyed came from the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. With the subsequent shut-off of oil and gas pipelines going from Russia to Europe, Moscow needed to find a large trading partner to export its bountiful natural resources. China managed to strike a much better deal with Russia, at least for itself, acquiring Russian oil and gas at roughly 50 to 70 percent of the price that Europe used to pay for the resources. As such, China now imports more oil from Russia than from any other country, reducing its reliance on the sea trade route between the Middle East, the second largest exporter of oil to China. Still, the country is heavily reliant on oil coming from Malaysia or the Middle East. In fact, it's been theorized that some of the oil imports to China are being relabeled as coming from Malaysia, UAE, or Oman, when in fact they're from Iran to avoid the US sanctions imposed against trade with Iran, particularly in oil. Therefore, some of the official numbers that Chinese economic portals distribute may have indicated that Malaysia has exported more oil to China than it actually has produced over that period. 
Another way that China has been attempting to reduce the reliance on the Malaccan Strait is the proposed Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. The initiative started in 2013, with China proposing a development strategy in over 150 countries and organizations. Over the following decade, China has invested $1 trillion into various projects to developing countries, largely in the form of loans, to build up their infrastructure for both air, sea, and land-based transport capabilities. In effect, the BRI contains two parts. The Belt is the current sea route that passes through the Malaccan Strait and goes toward the East African countries, the Mediterranean via the Suez and the Bab al-Mandeb Strait, as well as Iran and Iraq via the Strait of Hormuz. The second part is the road, which is made up of several independent developments to connect China to its largest trading partners in Russia and former Soviet countries in Central Asia, as well as providing a land route to the Middle East and as far west as Turkey. This would allow China to build up the necessary infrastructure to support significant developments of land-based oil routes from the Middle East, bypassing the need for those shipments to come via the Malaccan Strait. The counter to this strategy has been the US-backed India-Middle East-European Corridor. It would entail a combination of land and sea trade routes that connect the EU to Israel via sea, then connect Israel to the ports in the Persian Gulf via land, and finally ending with a sea route to India and beyond via the Malacca Strait. The US initiative aims to bypass the current blockades imposed by the Houthi presence south of the Suez Canal, endangering US-allied sea routes passing through the canal itself. However, there are two factors that are currently playing into China's hands. First off, the current conflict between Israel and Palestine has halted all efforts to formalize the agreement and move forward with building up the necessary infrastructure. This is mainly due to the current Hamas-Israel conflict, creating uncertainties over whether the region will be free of military incursions and conflicts in the near future, all of which would endanger the prospect of a land trade route between Israel and Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Secondly, the Middle Eastern countries have been largely ambivalent in the whole China-US debate. For most, they see both the Belt and Road Initiative and the India-Europe Corridor as beneficial developments in the region that the countries would only stand to benefit from. As such, most of the Middle Eastern countries would likely be receptive to implementing both options, preventing the US from exerting significant pressure on China via disrupting its fossil fuel trading channels. Furthermore, China's newfound success in gaining Russia as a staunch ally in global geopolitics potentially opens up the Arctic trade route that passes around the Russian Arctic holdings. Although the route isn't yet available year-round, since it ices over in the winter, the northern sea route from Southeast Asia to Western Europe is actually roughly 40% faster than the alternative route via the Malaccan Strait and Suez Canal. Current global warming trends predict that a global temperature increase of even a few degrees would have a significant effect on reducing the downtime imposed on the northern sea route from icing over. In this scenario, China could effectively trade with the EU via the Arctic rather than the Malaccan Strait. Finally, some more recent developments suggest that the Arctic itself contains a significant stockpile of natural gas and oil. In the event of global warming making the Arctic region more reachable, it could improve Russia's standing as one of the biggest manufacturers of petroleum and gas-based products in the world. For that reason, China has started making claims over the outer Manchuria region, which historically belonged to China before the Opium Wars in the 17th and 18th centuries. If China presses these claims, as it's been known to do see the current Taiwan conflict, it's possible that it might even look to expand deeper into Siberian territory and gain direct access to the Arctic. If this were to happen, China would become relatively independent since it would acquire the vast natural resources in Siberia – oil, gas, timber, and drinking water. With the BRI connecting China to the Middle East and a potential northern sea route connecting China to Europe, India's influence on Chinese trade would be severely diminished. However, the northern sea route is still only theoretical, and the current geopolitical situation heavily favors the US in any China-driven conflict. If China decided to pressure Russia, then the US could feasibly cut off the Chinese Navy at the South and East China Sea, removing its presence from Taiwan, and severing its trade link through the Malacca Strait. If that were to happen, China would lose the ability to fuel its war machine. Thus, China remains in a tense stalemate over the hotly contested Malacca Strait, and India is currently one of the biggest players in the region. But what is the most likely scenario between the two countries? While India and China are two of the world's most populous countries, they have mostly opposite views on global geopolitics. The tensions between the two countries have also surfaced over India's holdings in the Himalayas, where the country lost the Aksai region in 1962 during the Sino-Indian War. 
While the region is practically uninhabited and lacks natural resources, it provides a vital strategic goal by connecting China's other provinces with one another. Additionally, China's territory in the Himalayas allows it to bypass India via land and directly influence Pakistan and the Gulf of Bengal via land, which also has coincidentally become a part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. India considers this aggressive posturing an attempt to challenge its current relations with Pakistan, since the two countries have a long history of border disputes and geopolitical tension. This is further compounded by China exporting significant amounts of military equipment to Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Together with China, these three countries are the only land borders that India has to the outside world. We're discounting Nepal and Bhutan since they're effectively landlocked by China and India. If China manages to exert even more geopolitical pressure on India's neighbors, it would effectively be able to cut off India from the mainland and make it similar to an island nation where a bulk of its trade and communication happens through sea routes. As a result, India has been seeking allies elsewhere, particularly nations that have similar issues with China in terms of geopolitics. This brings us back to the aforementioned Quad. The four-member alliance has been ramping up efforts to strengthen relations with other parties in the area, such as New Zealand, South Korea, and Vietnam, where the organization started to refer to itself as Quad Plus. In the eyes of the Quad's members, this was a necessary move to respond to China's aggressive posturing in the Indo-Pacific. To that end, India has created a permanent military base on the Andaman Islands. Additionally, the U.S. has a military base close to every major bottleneck in international sea trade routes in the Indian Ocean, as well as the Chonggi base in Singapore close to the Malacca Strait's narrowest point. China has responded by creating a network of overseas bases in the Indo-Pacific. This includes a base in Djibouti close to the Bab el-Mandeb Strait, which can bottleneck the bulk of trade between North America or Europe and India via the Suez Canal, and which is precisely why the U.S. proposed the India-Europe Corridor. Strategically, while China and the U.S. are the two biggest players in the Indo-Pacific, India's control over the islands just west of the Malacca Strait give it a unique advantage in case of a conflict between China and any U.S. allies. The islands create a natural outpost that improves the strategic and tactical capabilities of the Quad in the Indian Ocean, giving the U.S. and India much deeper reach into the South China Sea than China can respond with elsewhere. The Quad has also been working to capitalize on this possibility. Yearly military exercises have been carried out by the US, India, and Japan as permanent members, with the Australian Navy participating again in 2020. As a result, the Quad countries are fully aware of the strategic value that the Indian coastline and archipelagos can have in a potential conflict against China. Other countries in the Indo-Pacific are likely to remain neutral in the US-China conflict since they're technically benefiting from maintaining positive geopolitical relations with both sides. As such, India, and to a lesser extent Singapore, is one of the few countries that has direct control of the Malacca Strait, and it's directly opposed to China. In a potential conflict, India would likely be able to install radar devices to control the air and sea space surrounding its archipelagos, and in effect the entire strait. Finally, the Andaman Sea is a deeper pocket of the Indian Ocean than the surrounding coastline. While the strait is typically a few hundred meters deep, the sea surrounding it plunges to around 12,000 feet. This allows India, one of the few countries with nuclear warheads, to situation its submarines directly in the way of any Chinese ships that wanted to pass through the strait. Currently, India has 164 nuclear warheads split between land, sea, and air-based missiles. While this is a far cry from China's 410 and Russia's 1,700 operational warheads, it creates a significant deterrent against China using its own nuclear weapons. Additionally, since the U.S. would likely instigate any Indo-Pacific conflict involving China, India could provide vital support before the bulk of the American Navy can be deployed from the military bases scattered around the rim of the Indian Ocean in the Middle East. One of the current challenges that India is facing is a lack of budget and direction in terms of its military presence around the islands. Due to its long-standing border disputes with neighbors on land, more than half of the country's defense budget is being spent on the army, while only 15% is allocated to the navy. Compare that to the US, where the navy receives roughly 22.6% of the country's annual defense budget. Of course, the scales are slightly different, with India having roughly one-seventh of the US's GDP and one-twelfth of its overall military budget. Regardless of India lacking the sheer offensive capabilities that China possesses, the strategic importance of controlling the Malaccan Strait makes it one of the crucial US allies in the Indo-Pacific. In a future conflict against China, India would be able to deliver a devastating first blow to China by cutting off most of its sea-based trade routes before China could respond. 
then it would be up to the US to take care of the rest. But what do you think of the current tensions between China and India? Can China become less dependent on the critical Malaccan Strait anytime soon? Leave your comments below and thanks for watching the video. Now go check out how India is trapping China with its military strategy or click this other video instead.